Hi, I'm Toby Corey, and I'd like to welcome you to Entrepreneur Thought Leader Series presented by STVP, the Entrepreneurship Center in the School of Engineering and BASES, the Business Association of Stanford Entrepreneurial Studies. Today, we're excited to welcome Amy Francetic. Now, Amy's the founder and managing general partner of Buoyant Ventures, a new venture fund in Chicago that aims to invest in digital climate solutions. She previously founded and led Energize Ventures. Her career spans over 20 years of high technology entrepreneurship, private equity, and research. Amy also co-founded and served as the CEO of technology accelerator Clean Energy Trust and held roles at private equity firm MBC Capital and the Stanford Research Institute. Earlier in her career, she was co-founder and CEO of a tech company that she sold to Lego Systems and she helped fundraise for mobile gaming company, Glue Mobile, on whose board she served until it went public on the NASDAQ. Amy has a BA from Stanford University. Welcome, Amy. Thank you. Thanks, Toby. Thanks so much for having me. It's such an honor to be here. I wish I could take this class. Can I <laughs> to the next session? Well, we're honored to have you now. I'm going to open up with, is it pure luck, the universe, or the Greek earth goddess Gaia working her magic that you're here today? leading a climate, a climate crusade on Earth Day. Absolutely, 50th anniversary, woo woo. I know, huh? <laughs> All yeah. right, so we got a lot to cover and such limited time, so let's kick things off. We're gonna start with a quick quiz using our Zoom polling function just to set the stage for today's talk. So um, here we go, that quiz should come up in a second, but let me read the question. Um, how have green energy funds fared over the last six years compared to general VC funds. Um, you guys can see it looks like the polls up there. So um, start answering the poll. We're gonna reveal the answer a little bit later in the conversation. So Amy, let's get into it. You started your career developing children's software, educational software, then you sold a company to Lego, then over to a leading think tank, Stanford Research Institute, off to private equity, venture capital work. You founded a technology accelerator called Clean Energy Trust. Um, then left to raise a $165 million venture fund at Energize Ventures. You've served on private nonprofit boards. Now you've started Buoyant Ventures where you are focusing on digital climate solutions. I will say that's a really heavy polymath career trajectory. Um, could you walk us and the students through that journey and share some of your insights and lessons learned because it's fascinating. Well, thank you so much. I uh, I feel like um, when you recite it all, I feel really old, um, <laughs> but I do feel like I still have so much to do. So um, I think the uh, the key theme is entrepreneurship. You know, this Buoyant Ventures is my fourth startup. Um, and I think it's been really great to, uh, you know, take what I learned at Stanford and to try new things and take risks and um, a big part of another theme that kind of is a thread throughout my career is working alongside of engineers and scientists. And I guess I always wish that I had become a scient scientist or uh, become an engineer and instead I'm a business person. And so I try to do the best that I can to apply my business schools, uh, skills rather to uh, scientists and engineers to help them realize their dreams. So um, that's a big part of what's driven me, you know, throughout my career, I'm, uh, Kind of a science junkie. I love to read about it. I love to talk to the scientists. I love to, you know, think, try to understand how they think. And, um, and I'm also really, you know, struck by the potential of all these great ideas that are coming out of labs and universities. And how can we bring, you know, capital to help these um, people, you know, tackle some of uh, our most daunting challenges like climate change. And I think that's a, it's, I'm, I have great respect for anyone who dedicates their their life's work to that and I want to help them be successful. Yeah, so one thing uh, related to that, I guess is that you have been able to find and cultivate really great mentors throughout your career. That's a huge topic at Stanford. I've been teaching now there for 10 years. So how has how have mentors shaped your career and like what have you, what have you done to really uh, help find some people that have made a big difference in your life and your career? Well, I think um, I, I think I, I have to embarrass one of my very early mentors whose um, name is Kathy Schlein, who uh, she has a, a, a lot of Stanford folks in her family, but she was a friend of mine. She was my boss actually early on in my career when I worked for Hasbro and we were making a line of kids software. And, um, and when I remember very fondly that one of our first interviews, um, she was a runner. I was a runner at Stanford too. I walked onto the track team. So I wasn't good enough to be recruited, but I, 
love to run so much that I uh, walked onto the track team. And the only reason I really raced at all was because the gal who was an Olympic athlete in my races was injured. So that's why I was able to race on the Stanford track team while I was there. But uh, Kathy was a runner too. And we both ran 800s and she really drilled me in our first interview about what my times were. And so I think if they weren't respectable, she probably wouldn't have hired me. But um, I think it's really important for women to find women mentors. I think that's an, a really important thing. Kathy was a great mentor of mine. Um, she um, really taught me to speak up for myself and she really set a great example about being authentic and being your authentic self. And, um, and I think being fearless, that's a really, um, you know, she worked alongside Steve Jobs. And so she had picked up a lot of great experiences um, working with him at Apple and, and try to bring that to us um, and, and relay some of those great learnings. So, um, but I think also there's, you know, there, it's great to have women mentors, especially for young women starting out in the business world, but sometimes they, you, know, you have to also find great men mentors as well. And so I've had a number of those throughout my career and folks that um, help me kind of realize some of my goals and um, also maybe try to help avoid some of the pitfalls, you know, pointed things out and we're honest when I needed that honesty and, you know, showed some tough love, which is really important is to get, have real honest feedback from your, your mentors and your, your peers whenever possible. And you really realize then how rare that is, you know, it's really rare to get someone who can really tell you, you know, when someone's told, you no, or they're sort of not letting you do something, you don't often get the feedback about why or how to do it better. And so it's really valuable to work with people that um, can be honest with you. And, and that builds a really terrific trust. Yeah, that's awesome. Fantastic. Um, so tell us um, what, led or inspired you to pursue clean energy because that's not the easiest industry to be in. Um, but what, what, what got you on that track? Well, I was working in the high tech business for the first part of my career and um, had started out actually in video games and, um, and then worked in the wireless business. And uh, I had run a company that um, spun out of a think tank that Paul Allen funded. Um, the think tank was called Interval Research and with the company was called Zowie. And that was one that I did also with um, Kathy. She was helpful and was an advisor to that company and, and, and um, gave us a lot of support. Anyways, so we, I moved to clean energy because um, there was a turning point in my life. Like at a relatively young age, I actually got sick. I had um, kind of a rare form of cancer and um, had that, um, fortunately had that treated. And um, in the recovery of that, uh, I just felt like, um, you know, I really wanted to do something with my life that was meaningful, that gave me more meaning and that was going to leave the world in a better place than, than you know, how it was. and. Um, I found so much great joy and comfort from being outdoors. I get a lot. I mean, basically nature is like my religion. So um, that's a really important, you know, um, important thing to me. And I wanted to protect that and make sure that it was around and healthy for my kids and their grandkids. So I thought, let's just, you know, put the rest of my career into trying to do something um, to address climate change. And so that's what I've done with the last few startups. It started with Clean Energy Trust and then um, energize and now buoyant ventures and um, and yeah I think we can I think we can do this I think we can turn this you know ship around I mean I really I just um, have been thinking a lot about you know climate change especially amidst the whole COVID crisis and really like what some of the leaders in Europe are doing where they're um, they're really trying to get the stimulus funding and the recovery funding that the EU is going to be deploying to um, invest in clean energy technologies and innovation because they don't want to go backwards. They don't want to be beholden to fossil fuels. They want to move forward and they want to do more coming out of this crisis to make things better and solve some of these other big challenges that we have. So, so that's kind of what drove me is I wanted to, you know, I just wanted to have more purpose in my work. Yeah, that's fantastic. I worked at Solar City and at Tesla and it's definitely not for the faint of heart. It's a space that uh, has got a lot of lobbying interest and there's uh, a lot of work to do. The good news, I do think that, um, I think sentiment is changing and I actually think COVID-19 is, is going to be a potential catalyst for that, but we'll get more into that in a little bit. So before we reveal the uh, uh, polling data, um, I wanted to get a better understanding of um, as you look at your investment thesis for your new fund, um, 
looking at digital climate solutions. So what does a good investment look like in general terms? Sure, sure. So uh, digital climate solutions means technologies that are primarily software, some hardware, internet businesses, the general tech, digital technologies that have made up most of the, um, the venture segment over the last several years, but applying them to industries that have the biggest climate risk associated with them. And so those industries are energy, agriculture, transportation, and the built environment. Those four industries are the major contributors to carbon emissions. And so we want to turn, use digital technologies to help businesses and some governments and communities address climate risk um, in their uh, businesses and their communities and to um, do this in a way so that it can be scaled very, very quickly, right? So there's a lot of, you know, great technologies that other investors are working on. People like Bill Gates and Breakthrough Ventures that are trying to um, look at battery chemistry or fuel cells or fusion even. And the challenge with those technologies is that they um, take a long time to mature and they require a lot of capital. And they're not necessarily built for a 10 year traditional venture fund. So with Boeing Ventures, we really wanted to um, use these very scalable technologies that require tens of millions of dollars as opposed to hundreds of millions of dollars to scale. And that, um, that have also, these, these technologies have also matured quite a bit over the last five years. So the value that they can bring to these businesses is, is more meaningful and is more impactful today than it was even five years ago. So, you know, the data that um, a lot of these businesses are contending with, the, the volume of data is overwhelming and trying to draw some kind of insights or competitive insights from the data is really, really challenging. So a lot of these young companies have created solutions that allow asset managers, business leaders, insurance companies to um, better understand and take signals from the market to make decisions that are gonna either help reduce the emissions in their business that will help them adapt to this new you know, climate reality or can help them operate more efficiently and do more with less. So that's just a broad yeah. sort of summary of our thesis. I know I can go into specifics or give you a couple of specific examples examples yeah. if you'd like. No, I, I think that was really helpful. So if the SDVP team could um, publish the results of the poll. So um, as you guys can see, pretty sure everyone can see on their screen, hopefully. So 61% uh, said that the funds fared 10% uh, better over the last six years of a general VC fund. 17% um, said 10% worse, 11% said 30% worse, and 11% said um, about the same. So but let me um, tee up a question because I'm gonna have, have you reveal the answer, Amy. So green tech was really red hot area like 15 years ago. I know, I think Kleiner and uh, Draper Fisher, there was a lot of aggressive money in that space. And of course I worked at Solar City and Tesla, but I know it's been a really tough business to make money and deliver returns, but what's changed since then? And, wh and why is the right time now? And before you answer that question, what's the real answer to the poll? Well, I think you know if you if you compare it to the general, I, I would compare it to to the IT and the tech funds. Okay. Like, so let, let's compare it to that, which have done very well over the last six years. So those funds have done quite well. It's actually fared thirty percent worse. Okay. <laughs> so, but, but but I think what's important, yeah. But I think what's important now is as we the landscape is different. Um, right. Heidi Rosen talked about that last week. So someone that had a evaluation, other folks that have had companies that were on fire are letting people go um, in mass quantities, right? So the world's an entirely different place. Right. Uh, so why now? We're at a really interesting time in history, right? Well, okay, so first to go back to the transition, the 15 year transition that you said to a sort of the last six years, right? So the, the yeah. you know, if you look back and you measure clean tech funds from say 2010 till now, they were, they had terrible returns, right? So they were, you know, single digits or negative, you know, not even returning their, um, their base capital. The, um, since in the last six years, they've done so much better. So the top quartile, clean tech funds have been delivering on average, according to Cambridge data, which is the data yep. that I'm citing um, up in the mid twenties. So that's really good. That's a really good venture return. That's a, you know, a three X net, that's a three X net return for, um, for these funds. The IT funds that, you know, the, the, the IT venture funds have done in the mid thirty. So they've been really great over the last six years. Yeah. And um, you guys know all about that. And some of the big funds in the Valley that have been leading the way there um, 
So, so what's changed? What's better now? So, if, so a few things have changed. Um, number one, the core equipment and technology for renewable energy is much, much more cost competitive and um, is much, much cheaper than it was 10, 15 years ago. So, um, you know, wind and solar are very, very inexpensive and, and um, some, of the, some of the lowest cost energy you can build, um, new generation you can build today, they'd certainly beat coal and nuclear in every market and even in some markets beat natural gas. Um, so the core base technology has become very, very cost competitive. Um, another thing that has changed is the, um, in the venture space is this addition, you know, there's been a lot of new capital that's come in that is looking for venture fundable technology. So there are some very ambitious folks that are shooting high and maybe looking for, you know, 20 year returns like breakthrough, but there's a lot of new funds that have been raised in the last four or five years and filling that gap that had existed before to help commercialize a lot of these technologies. And they're, they're getting very good at choosing you know, companies that can scale in a venture timeframe in a 10 year uh, timeframe. Um, and, you know, one of the things that's gotten, you know, worse is I think the, the political headwinds that we have in at least the United States. So you've got really great leadership happening globally you know, the rest of the world has kind of woken up to the fact that it accepts climate change and accepts the science. And then we've just, you know, in the, with this administration, we've had a lot of resistance. So the, um, the, you know, that has opened up some additional capital, like folks, it's almost sort of maybe activated a part of the market that before wasn't activated because they want to do something about it. So it's help, helped to bring some new capital into the market. And a lot of that new capital is coming from family offices and foundations and others that have a really strong, you know, impact and ESG impact drive for their capital. So they're looking for not just um, not just financial returns, but some environmental, social, or governance governance benefits for their capital. So that's a big thing that has changed in the last few years, and I think it's brought in some new sources of capital um, that have a really strong intention with their with their with their money. So that's at least where we've seen a lot of funds have been successful in raising from some of those folks. Yeah, I would agree, and I think too. Um, obviously we're going through a very difficult social transformation right now, but now seems like a really good time. It's a very contrarian point of view to actually start this initiative and look at some of the great companies that have been founded during the dot-com bust, the housing crisis. Yep. Uh, who would have thought a guy like Elon Musk could transform the transportation industry, right? So right. what are your thoughts on timing? I think the timing is especially good now because, you know, everybody has talked about how frothy the valuations were over the last few years and those are coming down. I mean, you want to be putting capital to work when you're at the bottom of the market. So this is a really good time for folks that have dry powder. Um, even, you know, I think the other thing that's really happened in the space that is exciting that we hope will resume, you know, post COVID is all of this, um, all of the promises and commitments from the super majors, but also all the institutional capital that is moving into the sector, right? So all the big banks have made commitments to uh, address climate risk in their portfolios, endowments, you know, the universities have, um, are getting a lot of pressure from the students to divest of fossil fuels. So that's helping to bring more capital into the market. And I think we'll see, um, we'll continue to see the momentum build again from those institutional investors. I don't think we're gonna go backwards and they're suddenly gonna say, oh no, we wanna go back to how we were investing before this. Um, I think that the, you're gonna see that the sustainable funds are going to outperform the traditional benchmarks. And they're certainly gonna outperform any funds that have any kind of fossil exposure in them, especially considering the price shocks that we're seeing in the oil and gas industry. So. I think you're going to see definitely a you know a good momentum returning to any of the folks that are investing with ESG um, top of mind, and I think we'll see some um, in big institutional players will double down. Yeah, I'd agree with you. So I think your fund is more Series B. Um, if I, yeah, if I got early stage. Right. Yeah, we're so in early stage I, Series A and B. Yeah. So for all those super talented, smart uh, folks that are thinking about becoming an entrepreneur and want to do something about what I think is the greatest human existential threat around climate change, um, what advice would you give a big idea entrepreneur on, on how to raise capital? And we all know that the top three reasons ventures fail. One is they find out there's no there's no need for their product or they don't get the product market fit. Or two, they have just the wrong people involved. Or three, they run out of they run out of capital. But 
you know, just sort of think about sort of how you're looking at the future, some of the opportunities here. What advice would you give a young entrepreneur that wants to do something in a climate change space? Well, first of all, I would say I draw a lot of inspiration from college students. You know, Clean Energy Trust has, since its origination in you know 2009, has been funding student-led businesses with their capital. Um, and they've had support from the Department of Energy as well as a number of corporate sponsors. So, you know, young people are gonna save us, but they have to save us. <laughs> We're counting on you all to save us. Um, but I think one, you know, one piece of advice is there's so many great support um, systems for young people starting companies, whether you're a student and you have support through a venture fund at your university. I know Stanford has terrific support um, in Brian Bartholomew's class and some other, you know, more accelerator type um, support systems there. You know, the Y Combinators and Techstars, I mean, that didn't, that's, that's a relatively, you know, recent phenomena and they do a really, really great job of helping people hone their business ideas and investors like myself, like we, we definitely go to all of those demo days. We, um, you know, we watch all of those pitches, um, Clean Energy Trust, you know, funds those student companies and you've got a lot of, you know, young, um, early, early stage support for new ideas. And I think that's really a great place to go learn from your peers, find mentors. Um, there actually is a Techstars um, sustainability initiative in Denver um, or Boulder that is also sponsored by the Nature Conservancy. So you now can find a Techstars type program specifically for climate. And I've heard really terrific things and have talked to the folks that run that and they do a really great job of helping um, people shape their businesses and get them in front of mentors and help run those interviews like you know um, Steve Blanks you know um, um, questioning that he does for for you know new business ideas I think that they they do a great job of giving exposure and helping people get in front of customers to hone their ideas so that's yeah. what I would say is get yourself into one of those programs um, so you get all that support wrapped around you. Yeah, I would agree. I think that um, I, I think your timing is is exceptional because I, I think if you sort of look at the how this, the evolution of software and look where it was just 10 or 20 years ago, it was really hard to build software. And with the tools and the frameworks that exist today and other new infrastructure companies like Plaid that comes out that allows you to plug into you know, any sort of bank for an ECH pull. And you look at the um, distributed energy assets that are sitting out there today. So I think your timing is great that there's enough of inertia and kind of raw material out there for the, for, for, um, the second act of the play that can really take this thing to the next level. So I, I love the space that you're in. So let's shift gears a little bit. Um, we're all dealing with a super uh, significant pandemic. Uh, we're seeing um, nothing like, I don't think any of us has ever seen in our lifetime um, the unemployment rate is skyrocketing. Um, I don't think we've ever seen an economic shutdown like we have uh, the health issues that, that we're all facing. How do you think COVID sort of, uh, what does it do to climate change? How do you see, how do you see it playing out? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, there's definitely a connection. You know, I think that what we've seen um, is that some of the people that have suffered the worst and have died have been in areas with a lot of air pollution. You know, they may have had underlying asthmatic conditions, which is again, very much a condition of living in highly polluted areas. So when you have a respiratory disease, that's a very strong factor. And, um, you know, when you've seen what happens when we shut down the economy around the world and you see how clear the air is and how clean the water is and all that, like, to me, that's a great opportunity that we just got a taste right before our eyes of how, of how good it could be. And we don't want to have to shut down the economy to achieve that. We want now human ingenuity to come up with solutions and technologies and policy that will help us achieve this, but stimulating the economy. And so I think, again, like I said, you know, what these 13 countries in the EU have called for um, an investment in the space. Um, and I think recognizing the job potential of the space as well. You know, the, the wind and solar and energy efficiency industries um, employ more people than the coal industry, three times as many people as a fossil fuel industry. And a lot of these businesses are small businesses. So you talk about, you know, the solar city and the, the Tesla roof. I mean, all those installers pretty much now are, you know, out of business, right? They're, they're well, they're, they're not working. Let's just say that they're not that they're out of business. They're not working. So you can't go and and really have that business continue if people won't um, 
you know, they're, they're not considered essential if they, and if you won't, people won't let you into their home then you can't do energy efficiency retrofits or do these installations either. So we need to get those folks back, um, back to work. And they, you know, more than half of the um, employees in the clean energy space are with small businesses. And that's just the job creation engine of the country. So, um, so I think we have to recognize that I hope in a future stimulus package or recovery package that clean energy will get some support because there was a lot of um, progress that was made in 2008, you know, under the Obama administration when they, they stipulated that um, those ARA funds, the American Recovery Act funds um, had to go into clean energy and it really did stimulate the growth of the business and help to bring the prices down in the, the energy that we have today and the equipment and that produces the energy today. So we, we need to we need to get this, you know, the industry back to work. We need some support um, for these workers. And I think we have to, we just got a taste of what, you know, what um, a, actually the, the emissions reduction over the last quarter is about equivalent to what we would need to, to do to um, prevent a rise in temperature by 1.5 degrees. So we just seen how that can happen, yeah. but now we can't do it by shutting down, you know, the economy. We have to do it with human innovation and, and policy changes. Yeah, I know you're 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 so spot on. I remember you know hearing some criticism from uh, the uh, the conservative side of the house about the federal tax credit. That's actually been around for quite some time, going back to the '60s to spur housing development, and and that was uh, so. Matter of fact, that money ends up coming back into the treasury anyway, and uh, so we were able to take like the cost on a per watt basis from oh, about eight dollars a watt down to uh, uh, about three or four dollars a watt uh, because of that federal tax credit and. It allowed for massive job creation, great paying jobs versus being in a coal mine or working on an oil rig or doing something that's just so damaging to our economy. And uh, it really is, it's quite unconscionable to sit here and look what's playing out. Um, I like you have a lot of hope. I think Generation Z and millennials um, are, they're wired differently. And I, and I think that you're gonna have this opportunity to unlock this incredible talent. So. Um, if you were had, a, if I gave you a magic wand and I said, uh, what would be the one thing we could all do to make the biggest impact around climate change? What would that be? The one thing, maybe eat less meat, would be one of the okay. one things you could do, right? So, um, and it's not obvious, but if it's an individual person, um, you know, um, livestock. Um, and the ag sector is a major contributor to emissions. So if we ate the, you know, the resources that are necessary to feed, um, you know, the, the livestock that we eat are enormous. The amount of water that it takes is enormous. So if we ate less meat, um, especially in the developing countries, we would um, have a potentially really positive effect on the emissions from the ag sector. I think that would be a major benefit. Yeah, I would agree. And they're really, they're, that, that's such a, um, a massive contributor and it doesn't quite get that play. My guess is that there's still really strong lobbyists in Washington. That, they're absolutely. Uh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but I would say, so I would agree with you. The second advice I would give is please get out and vote in November, people, especially yes. young voters. You're historically fickle and to the extent you can make the difference this November. So hopefully we get a lot of folks out there. That, Actually, we won't change anything if you don't vote. You know what I mean? Like we have to, we have to get young people to vote. And we know that um, climate change and sustainability is one of the number one issues for young people. So you have to make your voices heard. Um, and, and that's, we really, we really need you. Yeah. Okay. Um, we've got a whole bunch of questions coming in. I'm going to pivot to that in a second, but I had a couple last questions for you. So we've been talking about a business and a lot of shop and big thinking stuff and we're the thesis of your investment fund and where the world's going. So what do you do to reduce stress? I, uh, I run, I swim. I can't run as much as I used to. So I swim, but I can't swim now because all the pools are closed. So I get outside. I mean, that's my Nirvana, you know, I get outside with my dogs and my husband and my girls and you know, we just walk for miles and miles and run and get fresh air. And honestly, that's our saving grace right now. It's kind of keeping us mentally sane and physically sane. Although yeah. I know it will be months and months before I'll fit back into any of my pants. So yeah. um, it's helping, <laughs> but it's not making enough of a difference. It's not counteracting all of the cookies 
and um, <laughs> baking that my girls are doing here at home. So um, uh, yes, yeah, so I have to go get a bunch of new pants to wear. Well, I'm, I'm curious to know, because you know, you and I have had um, somewhat similar careers. It's a lot of pressure working for very high stakes companies and the demands are quite extraordinary. And I'll admit my, my work-life balance uh, historically has not been good. Um, but you've worked at some very high pressure jobs. You dealt with a, a, a life-threatening health issue and you just seem really centered. And, you know, so what else do you, what have you done throughout your career to kind of work through, you know, lots of stressful times and um, where you got to, to today? Whatever it's doing, looks like it's working. Well, you're very kind. And I, I don't, I mean, I think I, I, I don't really know if I have a great answer. I wish I did, Toby. I wish I had the advice. I think um, I feel a deep responsibility to try to make a difference. And um, I feel like people are counting on me and that makes a, a means a lot. And I, and I, and I function really well in a team. So I really like to be part of a team and I take really seriously, you know, the, um, the success that we all have that responsibility we have for success for each other. And so that's the biggest thing that kind of drives me yeah. to do the right thing is yeah. to think about my team, to think about my family. Um, you know, you haven't asked me what it's like to be a working mom. You know, I have two teenage daughters and definitely, um, had times, you know, where I've missed out on things that, that they were doing um, to work. But, you know, we talked a lot about why I was working and what I was doing and they were supportive of that, you know, goal and those and that mission. But I also tried to be in jobs where I had the flexibility so I could be there for the most important things um, yeah. when I needed to, you know, and that sometimes meant that you couldn't work for folks that weren't supportive of that. And yeah. um, so I think that that's another key thing for for women as they are in their careers is to really find those bosses that, you know, have a family and want to, you know, understand that they're going to get better work and better loyalty and commitment out of their employees if they are flexible and allow you to also be a mom and a wife and, you know, um, and a dad, you know, yeah. and, a and, to, and to turn up for your kids. That's so important. Yeah. Kind of somewhat related to that. Um, do you feel, if you look back again on your career, and I know some young students are just getting ready to start their career, did you get to where you got to where these things just sort of stacked on top of each other? Or was there some nonlinear moments where some, some positions and some things just really catapulted you um, far faster than kind of the, the, the linear step? I, it was definitely nonlinear. It okay. was definitely nonlinear. And actually one of the big sort of d debates I had with myself and some of my bosses and you know my peers was going back to business school so you know i have a ba from stanford and i don't have a business degree and when i was in my late 20s um i was um in the very fortunate position to be um running a company and i felt like i was learning so much running that company that i couldn't afford to take the time out to go back to business school like what i was learning you know raising capital and running the business was more important than learning it in a classroom, but I highly think, I highly recommend people do that because I know people, um, all of the MBAs that I've hired over the years have gotten so much out of that experience. And, you know, especially the relationships and friendships that they've built in business school has been so important, but that was always a debate that I had was, you know, should I be going back to business school or not? So I had a couple of opportunities early on where I got a lot of experience and that was all sort of on the job. And that's how I decided to learn. And then I filled in the gaps in areas where I didn't know, like I didn't know much about accounting. So I took an accounting class, you know, and nowadays you can do that too. You can sort of supplement your education relatively easily by taking online classes. So I'm a big believer in that and sort of learning what you can, you know, while you're working because you get to apply it right away. And that's sort of the best way to learn it too, is to put it to use the next day. So, um, so yeah, I think that, that, uh, yeah. kind of, I forgot even what your first question was. So. Yeah. Hopefully I didn't ramble too much. No, I, no, I think it's important because, it, you know, you sort of looking at this incredible career trajectory is like, wow, did these things sort of stack up and learn, learn, learn? Or were there, some, I know in my career, there were some moments where it was super nonlinear, where just like what I learned, it was an explosion. Other things were more kind of incremental. And uh, I was wondering if the, the same experience. And, and to that end, you worked at a really interesting, had a career stop at Stanford Research Institute, which is an incredibly secretive place. And I was curious to, that seemed to kind of be a little bit different. I know, you know, yeah. I've been curious to know what you learned there and uh, what that was all about. I loved my time there. It was 
Awesome. Um, I was actually working in the Ventures and Licensing Group for Norm Winarski, um, and he's credited with helping to identify what became Siri. I actually worked for a period of time with Adam Chire on what on the early, early, early part of the of the research that became Siri there. And my job was to be the business person to help um, either license, figure out the licensing of the SRI technology, or to raise help raise capital for spinouts. And they had a very good successful track record of turning their research into viable businesses, especially in the voice recognition area. Um, also in cybersecurity. So I worked a lot on cybersecurity there um, when I was with them. And you know that was super fun because it was just like, I love to be in the labs. I love to, um, to sit alongside these scientists and these crazy smart people and then just dream about, well, what could we do with this? Where would it fit in the market? Who would buy it? You know, how much would it have to cost? Like, what partners would we need? And that was my job was to think about um, the business part of it. And um, we got to interface with a number of venture capitalists that were supporting um, that effort at SRI. So they had put together this great advisory panel of some of the top venture capitalists in the area to help review their technologies and to have opinions about that. And that was super fun, but I loved working with Norm. And um, I actually, the reason that I stopped working there was we moved back to the Midwest to raise, once I had both of my daughters, we really wanted to be closer to family. So we moved back to, from Menlo Park, we moved back to um, the North shore of Chicago to raise our kids closer to my family. So that's what disrupted that. Otherwise I think it would have still been there working on that. I love that was one of you know my favorite job experiences. Yeah. It was so, in so intellectually stimulating. Yeah, it's a very fascinating place. Some amazing technologies are, are conceived and birthed there. So that, that seemed like it was a great stop. Okay, um, one last question. We had all, uh, some really cool questions popping up in the Q&A, but um, lastly, so if you went back in time to your freshman year at Stanford, what would you do differently? Well, I would think, let me, let me talk about my Stanford experience in general. Okay. One thing I would do differently that I, that I regret is I never studied overseas. So I okay. wished I had done that. That's what I wished. One thing I wished I had done. And I, you know, we didn't have a lot of money. I was on a big scholarship. I had to work throughout my Stanford career. I had a big loan. So I think that felt very luxurious to me. And I didn't think I could afford to, to do that. Um, um, so I wished I had done that because everybody I know that did it had a great experience. And I sort of, you know, then set about after graduating, trying to travel a lot because I missed having that experience as a, as a student. But I do remember one thing, one, one piece of advice is I would give a little more forgiveness to myself that freshman year because it was, I came in, I was class valedictorian in high school. I had straight A's, um, but I was not prepared for the intellectual rigor of some of the advanced math and science classes at Stanford and they just kicked my butt. And I remember feeling I was so, um, I was just like so uh, humbled. It was really, <laughs> yeah. I think it, it, took, it like, took me quarters to recover from that, like signing up for some of these classes and I thought, oh my God, I'm not, I don't belong here. I totally had that, you know, imposter syndrome. I don't belong here. Like, what am I doing in these advanced math classes? So I, I had to get sort of um, put into the right classes. And that was really, it was like it, a huge confidence, shattered my confidence. And I think I, I wish I would forgive myself a little bit more for, um, for those experiences and maybe fumbling a little bit freshman year, figuring out, you know, what, where I belonged and what classes and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I love it. So look, I think I think fate played a big role in you being here today on Earth Day. I I so applaud your work and effort and courage in what you're doing. And I don't know if we've hit 420 parts per million yet. I know we we're at 419 last time I checked, and um, we're clearly not on a sustainable path. And I've looked at studies that show, um, you know, within a hundred years, so students, your kids are going to be inheriting something quite extraordinary here. It could reach two trillion dollars a year to deal with climate change. Um, that's not going to education, that's not going to infrastructure, that's not going to investments in the future it's paying for the past. So it's not too late. Um, thank you so much for everything that you're doing. I think your fund's gonna be phenomenally successful. And um, I think you've shared some amazing uh, insights with our students today. So we got a little bit of time, let's do some Q and A. And so they've uh, got some good votes here. So the most voted up question is broadly speaking, what does the success scenario look like for climate change technology and what is the end game and how different um, and how is it different from today? Mm. 
Well, let's see. Let's talk about, you know, wow, success. What does success look like? So I think we kind of saw it a little bit, like I said, just the last, you know, the last month or so as we saw how, you know, how you can see the Himalayas from the cities, you know, in India, how you can, how clean the air is in LA and, and um, in, uh, in China. I think, you know, success is, is um, definitely keeping us under that threshold, um, the emissions threshold and the temperature threshold. I think more importantly, it is, um, you know, we've caused a lot of damage even to the ecosystem and the biodiversity. And I think that it helps, you know, big success will be restoring that um, and these habitats that a lot of the, you know, we've encroached upon a lot of the habitats of, of all the animals and that's been a big cause of infectious diseases, right? So as we've encroached upon their natural habitats, we've seen more and more, you know, animal to human um, infectious diseases. So I don't know that it's going backwards to what we had before, but I think it's a, like renewing the biodiversity, it's clean air and water. And I think, you know, a big part of it from a, um, a like you think about the energy sector in particular, I think getting us to a hundred percent um, clean energy is definitely doable. I think we can get there. I think you know, what we need is we need the political will to build transmission and to connect up all the renewable energy in the rural areas where it's very inexpensive to produce it and to deliver it to the load centers, but also to you know have some of the changes in the energy rules so that we can transmit that power over state lines. I know you guys have a special situation there in California, um, you know, with you know figuring out how to import enough renewable energy, but also how to deal with your solar. You have so much solar and, and, and how much curtailing that will be. So how do you sort of balance that on the grid? So a lot of these are very, to me, those are very sol solvable problems. And I think if we have the political will to get there and can change some of the rules and regulations so we can use all these technologies that exist and just put them to work and let them do their thing, then I think we can make really tremendous strides. And I think we have it, you know, Tesla and their amazing electric cars, they basically help to, you know, make the EV market. So we'll get back to that eventually. Like EVs are going to take a major hit from COVID, like just people's disposable income and people aren't going to be buying as many cars. But again, I think that the internal combustion engine is um, not necessarily going as fast as the way of the coal plant, but it's kind of on that trajectory. So I think that that will resume and we'll get there on the transportation sector um, and removing the emissions in, in that sector. So I think we can get there. I think we just have to let all of the great inventions we already have, they have to be scaled and we need support you know, from the government to do that in a um, sort of a rulemaking and regulatory standpoint. And if we had if we had a price on carbon and we could get the political will to do that, that would accelerate us in the really positive direction. Um, so um, maybe we can get that with a new administration. Yeah, I mean, I would agree 100%. And I remember back when um, and Elon was very active at Solar City while I was there as our chairman. And I remember um, when kind of these green products first came into the marketplace, they were typically not as good and they cost more. And, and that was just like an anathema to Elon. And if you think about it, they don't advertise an electric car. Like he's completely transformed the driving experience. It just happens to be electric. It happens to be great for the environment. I think that's the opportunity that's there. How do we create extraordinary, awesome products, big thinking, big breakthrough opportunities um, that the market wants and needs? And the, the timing is so right. I mean, we're literally dealing with 100-year-old technology. That's how old our electrical infrastructure is today. So, and we've got kind of the first wave of uh, renewables that has, you know, sort of made its mark and in, in, uh, are being deployed today. So the opportunities are just absolutely huge, but you're right. We, we need to elect the right folks that are not thinking about yesterday, are not thinking about 1950s policies, and are thinking about what's right going forward for humanity, the viability of our planet. And um, it's gonna, this November is gonna be really important, so. Okay, uh, next uh, question that was voted pretty high here. How do you see travel impacting climate change in the future? There seem to be potentially two camps. The camp travel will decrease in light of COVID and the camp that uh, travel will continue to steadily increase as access to transportation becomes more widespread across the world. And as global population increases, how will the travel problem be solved in the future as we work towards global sustainability? Mm. I think I'm, I think that, well, certainly travel is going to be curtailed, you know, until we have a better handle on a vaccine, right? So that's really the, I think the big thing, and we won't, even once we have a vaccine, we won't have it. 
um, produced in enough volume to really vaccinate everybody that needs it, right? So that's, you know, inventing it is one thing and then producing enough of it is, is another thing for sure. Um, so I think I think that travel will resume. I I'm I think that the virtual is great. I think it's absolutely helpful. You know that we have all these amazing tools. And when I think about digital technologies, I think about how Zoom scaled from 10 million users to 200 million in a quarter. You know, like we we have these tools that are going to make it easier to to communicate virtually, so we won't have to meet as often in person. Um, but I do think that you know I don't. I mean, we're such a you know, I, I'm a, I don't think we're going to go backwards on the globalization. I really don't. I think the effort to try to prevent that is futile. I think that, you know, trying to keep people out of this country and trying to limit the, um, to limit immigration and also trying to limit um, dependencies that we have on each other, the countries have on each other. I, I just don't think that that's worthwhile. I think we have to embrace that and we have to be more prepared in the future when the next pandemic happens because it will happen. It's going to happen. I mean, it's gonna happen again. So we we have to learn everything we can from this one to know how to get communication out um, and how to um, how to treat everyone, you know, more successfully, how to make sure our hospitals are better prepared and have all the equipment that they need um, to be more effective. You know, that's been such an issue is for them to have what they need to do their jobs. They don't have what they need. So I think we're gonna to have to rebuild all the stockpiles. And I think that again, like the whole supply chain for medical equipment is completely global. So you can't, you really, I think we have to just embrace the fact that we are dependent upon each other and make sure that we have better systems for dealing with the next pandemic. But I do, I am hopeful that global travel will resume. And um, I think that, you know, from a carbon standpoint, um, you know, that is a big e emitter and we do have ways we can address that in jet fuel. We have ways that we can address that certainly with electric vehicles. Um, and then even, you know, I was talking to Maersk the other day and the shipping industry is a huge, huge opportunity to address for emissions and looking at pulling carbon out of the shipping industry and the transportation industry, the logistics end of things. Like you can do so much more with less fuel. Um, and there's a lot of great innovation that you can use to reduce um, the amount of fuel needed to transport these goods. And, and Maersk is one of the leaders in that area. They've got a commitment to be um, to net zero carbon by, I think they're 2040, they're trying to get there by. So like that's incredible um, goal that they have because especially since the fuel for the shipping industry is so, so dirty, they have to do even more than others do than say the airlines do to try to um, try to address that. But I think I think we will. We again, we have the, the innovation. You know, we know how to make biofuels. We know um, to help the 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 um, you know to help flight and to help the airline industry. And we know that electric can do their part. You know, electric vehicles, trucking, fleet, everything can be happening at the on the sort of vehicle front. So I think we'll get there, and I think it will resume. It'll take a long time, and um, I know people are probably going to be starved for getting back together in person too. I think. Yeah. We just, you know, we won't do it as much, but we're going to really do it for what's really, really important. Yep, I agree. Okay, we have one last question. Uh, let's see, in your opinion, what, uh, let's see, wait, okay, wait, here we are. In, in your opinion, what are some near uh, future green alternatives to fossil, excluding nuclear? Okay. Um, well, you know, I think the, the alternatives to fossil, I mean, we've got you know, wind and solar are super effective, right? So we, so I think deploying that at scale and, you know, we've got a lot of rooftops that could still take solar on them and putting battery storage and pairing those with battery storage is really important. So we've seen yep. that that can be very cost-effective. Tesla has been a leader in that for sure. Um, so I think deploying the technologies that we have um, at scale and then focusing on the transmission of that power. That's the transmission is the really the difficult piece. If we could transmit the clean power more easily to where it's needed, that would solve a lot of the problems that we have. So, um, you know, you've got um, uh, some really great thinkers there at Stanford that are thinking a lot about this problem and how you do this. And I tend to agree with them, uh, Mark Jacobson and some of the others who aren't looking for us to depend upon um, nuclear power, um, and they're certainly, you know, planning for storage to be a big, big part of that solution. But even if we didn't get to 100%, if we got to 80%, we 
we'd be in really, really good shape, you know? Yeah. So I think if you still needed to use gas peak or plants in certain locations, um, you know, if you still, you know, if you kept a, open the, the nuclear plants longer than they're supposed to be, which is basically the entire fleet that we have in the country is operating way beyond its useful life. But if you could safely keep them online for a little bit longer, I think you could get there with really, um, with more transmission and with more um, storage that's deployed at an even greater scale. Yeah, I would agree. I think just the, the efficiency of panels is gonna, gonna leap in the not too distant future. I think just how smart storage is gonna be is gonna be incredibly transformational. And I think just adding intelligence in to make the grid smarter because it's still pretty dumb today. Uh, yeah. Aside from some very few pockets. And, you know, for example, I was recently on the board of directors of a company that's doing some really great work. And actually energy trading is still very inefficient. It's done on an Excel spreadsheet with lots of human beings. And the company that was involved in is, is transforming that through AI. But the most important thing is that because the problem is that these renewable energy assets, it's really hard to monetize them. Um, because of the efficiency of the trading market. So this technology actually will allow for more both in front of and behind the meter um, renewable energy assets that can be monetized. You're going to get those funded more and you're going to then take another leapfrog forward in getting off fossil fuel. So huge opportunities going forward. So yeah, we really we really do have a lot available to us. We just have to put it to work. We need a commitment to put it to work at scale. And I think we can we can get there. I, I, yep. I really believe that. Yeah, look, this has been an incredibly fascinating talk. It was so great to meet you. Thank you for coming on ETL. Amy, what a great talk. All right, folks, we want to invite you all to tune in next week to hear from Joe Tsai, a member of Alibaba's founding team and now executive chairman in conversation with SDVP faculty director, Tom Byers. Amy, have an amazing day. Thank you so much. Toby, and, um, thank you. And thank yeah. you so much for everything you've done in your career too, to, uh, to help us with uh, this fight against climate change. And thank you to Tom Byers, and your whole team for having me. I'm I'm so I'm so honored. I'm so honored that you wanted to to talk. And I'm I'm very inspired by all that this that the students are doing. Yeah. So they're they're gonna yeah. save us. Well, we're gonna see you at 178. You're gonna get the link for that. And uh, I'll catch you in a few minutes. Sounds good. Thank all you. Right. Thanks everybody.